Hi everyone and welcome to AXA Coral Live. It's amazing to have you all with us and we have a fantastic Meet a Coral Scientist lesson for you today. Now Ben is joining us all the way from Curacao where we normally be. Hi Ben, how are you? Hi, I'm doing very well. How are you doing? Fantastic. Ben, we've, we've got some amazing um, shout outs and, and lots of classes watching. So I'm just going to we'll go, go through those and I'd love to find out a bit more what you've been up to. Yes, um, I'm here on Curacao. So that is a Caribbean island just off the coast of uh, Venezuela. And I'm here at the Marine Research Station, the Camabi Research Station, where I do research on sponges. Fantastic. Um, so joining us, um, all connecting to um, Curacao and the Kamabi Research Station, we have uh, students from the UK, USA, Ireland, Canada, uh, Bermuda and Ecuador. Um, and we've got some special shout outs for some of the classes watching. We have uh, a big hello to everyone in year five at St. Bartholomew's um, in Sydenham. So hi to all hi. year five uh, students there. Um, we have Year 6 at Wilmington High School in southwest London uh, who are really excited about hearing from the coral research scientists and finding out more. Um, we have a big shout out to 6A and 6B um, and to Madame Dubois and her coral art and Mr Smith and Mrs Farrah. So hi to everyone watching uh, from Wilmington. Uh, we've got May and Florence uh, who are home educating. Hi both. Uh, class 4 at Westington Primary School in Derbyshire. Um, good afternoon to everybody watching from there. Uh, all the boys and girls at St Anne's Catholic Primary School in Chelmsley Wood. Um, just so your teachers have been telling us uh, that you've been working incredibly hard to find out more about the oceans and marine life and big well done uh, from all your teachers. Um, we've got a year three at Sydenham High Prep School. Um, we're looking forward to answering all your questions. Uh, we've got 4PB at the Willows Primary School in Stoke-on-Trent, England. Um, and we have Isaac, um, apparently stop shouting out, um, but apparently you've been doing really, really great work there. Um, hello to everyone. And this is a, a, a school in Ecuador. This is the Gutenberg Schule. Um, and the, joining us, and Ecuador has coral reefs, which host a large number of species. And that's why they are very, very happy to be finding out more about this topic. Big shout out uh, to Lee Primary School. Hi to all the teachers and students there. And uh, we've got Irby Primary School in Cumbria in the UK. And fab to have you back with us. A uh, huge thank you uh, to all the teachers there who apparently are working really hard with their classes. And then last but by no means least, um, it's a big hello uh, to Emma, sorry, Emmy, uh, Posey and Micah as well. Fantastic to have you all with us on AXA Coral Live. Um, and Ben, you were, you were saying that you are at our usual home from home um, in the Caribbean. Uh, a field research station known as Kamabi, and uh, why why are you why are you um, at Kamabi, and what what is this field research station thing? Yeah, Jamie, here um, I'm at Kamabi because I want to do my research, and um, basically the research station here is you can think about it as a kind of special science hotel. So you, you can go there, there are rooms. And so it's very similar to a regular hotel. Just you have many other add-ons as well. In a hotel, you may have a pool or a sauna. What you have here additionally are, there are laboratories where you can do um, experiments, analyze your samples. You have direct access uh, to the beach. You also have a dive shop here where you can rent dive equipment. You have boats so that you can actually go out on the reefs. And you also have aquarium facilities. So if you go out and you collect some animals, then you can take them back, place them in the aquaria and uh, can do your experiments there. So it's a great place to be also to meet a lot of other scientists. And I'm currently here on a field trip. And um, we've got uh, so many questions but for you. But just before we start, I'm just going to give a sort of general outline um, of this live lesson so that those watching know what to expect. 
So this uh, Meet a Coral Scientist uh, live lesson is really your opportunity to ask as many questions as possible. And I know a huge number of you have sent some of those in advance and we've got those and we'll be going through those. But please also do post your questions live. And there are two ways that you can do that. Uh, first of all, uh, we have um, YouTube live chat and you'll need to have an adult logged into YouTube. So at home, that's a parent, guardian or carer. At school, that's a teacher. And you can just post those questions in and those will come through to me and we can put that into the conversation we're having with Ben. So think of me, uh, my name's Jamie, as your sort of like go-between um, between all those questions you've got in your classes and Ben's expert brain and experience. Um, you've also got, if you can't get into uh, the YouTube chat, on the Encounter EDU website, that's EncounterEDU.com. There's a speech bubble in the bottom right-hand corner, and whether you're on mobile, tablet, or laptop, or other device, click on that. And Sim, uh, who's moderating um, this chat, Sim, part of the Encounter EDU team, will get that sent over um, to us as well. So really looking forward uh, to having all these different questions uh, coming through uh, and getting them, to, getting them to Ben. So let's just start off, Ben. Um, you're, you're there doing your research. What, what do you do research on? Yeah, I'm doing research on sponges and the role of sponges. And I guess many of you don't really know what a what a sponge is. A sponge is an animal, uh, a really old animal. You might see them from uh, you might see them in the kitchen or in the bathroom, or maybe you're you're watching uh, SpongeBob. But uh, sponges are is incredible animal. It is one of the or it's basically the oldest animal still still alive, much older than dinosaurs or many other uh, animals. And they are they can come in many different shapes and sizes. They can be very, very thin layers, just a millimeter uh, thin or so. But then you also have giant barrel sponges that can be uh, several meters in, in diameters, basically as big as a VW Beetle was the uh, biggest one that was ever recorded. So they, they can come in different colors. They can be bright orange or green or red or uh, what color you, you, you can imagine, often more colorful than uh, even corals are. Ben, that's amazing to hear. So I've, I've just had that shattered so that the sponge, the natural sponge that maybe I don't use now, but my, my grandparents had a natural sponge in their bathroom or, or, or kitchen. That's, that's a sort of animal skeleton. Is that what you're telling me? Uh, it's not really the animal skeleton. It is more the, 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 the dry tissue, what you still have to, because sponges have a skeleton made out of, uh, most sponges, I must say, have a skeleton made out of glass needles. So you won't, don't want to rub that uh, on you, but there are specific sponges that you want to use for, for the bath, and they do not have these skeleton needles. They just have this kind of spongy uh, material, which, which gives, them some, gives them some structure, and that are exactly the ones that you want to use for uh, scrubbing your back. And, and it's incredible. You, you, I've, seen, I've seen some of the, the imagery, that, uh, some of the photos that you've taken during your research. So I, I've got an idea feeling that the oldest multi-celled animal on the planet didn't come into being to help me have a shower, but maybe has a, another role to play um, on the coral reef, on this magnificent underwater environment. Yeah, so uh, sponges are, the most thing was sponges too, they cannot walk, they cannot move, so they are uh, sitting there similar to a plant, but actually they are an animal or, or a coral as well. They cannot move, so they are fixed to the bottom. And what they do is they are able to pump a lot of water. And uh, one sponge can pump more than 1,000 uh, liters a day. And while pumping it, I think Ellie might also have a nice uh, video what we can show. If we add some, if we add a dye next to it, you can really see how it's entering in the sponge. And after a few seconds, it's coming out and then you just see how much water the sponge is pumping. The sponge is not just doing that because it's fun, 
but that is actually the way for the sponge to eat. So sponges are taking then out bacteria and, and small algae that are in the water. And uh, basically the water that comes out of the sponge, there are hardly any bacteria in there. So they remove a big amount of bacteria from the water. That is one part, but similar to us, we are eating food, but we are also drinking and sponges can do a similar thing. So they also drink some of the food, what they need. And that is called that are sugars and other substances that are dissolved in the water. So it's as you would take some uh, sugar and put it in your tea. Similarly, you have a lot of these compounds also in the water. And of these compounds, most of them are like what we have here, some, some beans or, or, or chickpeas and, and other beans. So basically, there are many different compounds, but most of them, they are not really that nice to, to, to eat. They're, they're super dry. No one would like to eat them. And then there is yeah, some other things like uh, these M&Ms, what I have here. Everyone would like to eat them right now, I guess. And there are just a few of those intermixed with all the other things that cannot be eaten. And the sponge is able to specifically take out specific M&Ms out, out of this mixture. And my research is about to see, is it which parts of these M&Ms are actually taken up by the sponges? Is it that they only go for green ones or maybe also for yellow ones? And um, most most microbes, uh, most animals cannot take up these dissolved uh, substances, but sponges can and bacteria, microbes can do as well. And that is why I'm really interested what parts of this mixture can be taken up by sponges, what parts can be taken up by microbes. So th th that sounds fascinating. So you're, you're looking at what role sponges play in sort of almost providing food for, I mean, I've got a picture of the reef from Curacao behind me. Um, very sadly, couldn't make it out this year. Um, but what, how they help to feed all these animals behind? Yeah, so um, as most animals cannot directly use uh, these, these the dissolved substances or cannot drink, sponges can. And what they, what they then do is they don't uh, use the, the food in order to get bigger and bigger. I mean, yes, they do, but they grow rather slowly. What they do instead is they uh, always kind of shed old cells, remove them, and uh, then replace them with new cells. So they constantly produce new cells, but instead of getting bigger, they just keep themselves young. And the old cells, they just expel. And uh, these cells are then very good food for a lot of animals on the, like small shrimps, for example, but also some, some fish. And they start eating then on these cells that are released. And uh, by doing so, the sponges are converting something dissolved that no one can use into something nice food, what uh, small animals can eat, bigger animals will, will eat the smaller animals. And so it's basically going up the food chain. That's so cool. So what you're... I think what you're saying is that the sponge takes sort of sugary water and makes it into cereal, <laughs> kind of, kind of. Yeah. For, for bigger animals to eat. So without sponges, all that sort of sugary water wouldn't couldn't be used as energy for all these fish and shrimp and eels and octopus. Yeah, exactly. So, so the, sponges the, the, are pretty cool. Sponges are pumps and sponges are converters that just make out of something what no one can use, something really yummy to eat. There we go, the, the, the chefs of the underwater world. Um, we've got so many questions, um, Ben. Um, I, I'm just gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna go through them sort of one by one. Uh, and really guys, this is, this is your chance. This is, we're gonna go rapid fire. I think we've had over 40 questions submitted in advance and we'll, and it's super important that we can answer as many of them as possible. Um, so Sebastian from um, the Gutenberg School in Ecuador would like to know, what is the most interesting thing that you have found out about corals? You can go back to the corals on the coral reef. 
Yes, if I go back to the corals in the coral reef, I think the most interesting thing, um, I was involved in some um, coral spawning uh, research and we found that there were also corals. So coral spawning is when corals release egg and sperm and it's all synchronized and basically you see everywhere where, where that is coming up and that is really, really cool to see. And people know about it, but we never really know when it's happening. It's usually at night. And a few years ago, together with some colleagues, we, we saw that there were also some of the corals that spawn during the day. So at the end of the day, there was still light. And basically, they repeat that not just once a year, but over half a year, every month at the same time, timed with the moon. So and that was really, really cool and really interesting to see. Amazing. Uh, and uh, talking about corals, uh, they're, they're, uh, are they uh, a plant? Because they look sometimes tree-like. This before we get into our, our coral questions. Yes, so uh, corals are animals, but they look like a tree. They look like a plant because uh, inside of them, in their skin, they have tiny little algae. And what algae do, what all plants also are doing, they uh, use sunlight and uh, convert it then to sugars and to, and to energy and use it then to grow. And the problem is on coral reefs, there is hardly any food in the water. So corals can also just pick food, uh, like small, small shrimps and other things that are in the water. However, um, on a coral reef, there is not much of that. So in order for them to live there, they live together with algae in their skin which uh, make photosynthesis, produce these sugars, and the algae is then giving these sugars to the coral. And in return, coral is giving them some other, for the coral, waste products so that the algae can grow. And as they need sunlight, they also want to have a shape that looks more like a plant, that they can get as much sunlight as possible. And, and Ben, um, can can uh, corals communicate with each other? We've seen, we've got some pictures, and I think you've got a coral, coral with you. Can can they can they communicate? Uh, communicate. So if you have a, a coral colony, what we can maybe also a little bit see here. There are tiny little. So that is just a skeleton. But imagine in here in the skeleton, which is made out of calcium carbonate, you have small polyps, tiny little animals, and one colony is many many animals that are growing together. And they communicate with each other and they can also, let's say, if this polyp here is catching uh, some food, they can also transfer it to the uh, polyp that is over there. Uh, that is within one colony. But can they also communicate, let's say you have two corals next to each other, can they also communicate um, to a certain point? Because on a coral reef, there is not much space, and there's always a kind of a fight for more space. So uh, corals, they all have also special stinging cells. And if then uh, one coral touches the other, then they shoot these stinging cells on the other one to kind of fight it back. So if you want to say it's also a kind of communication, not necessarily the best art, so maybe it's better to talk to each other than to shoot uh, with stingy things. But um, to a certain point, they also communicate, yes. Ben, we've, we've got some we've got some very specific um, sponge questions um, here. Um, we've we've got um, from Wimbledon High and Union Point. We've got what what sort of predators do sponges have? Sorry, what sort of predators? What eat sponges? Oh, predators, predators. Yes. Um, so there are many fish, like angelfish, for example. They are feeding on on sponges. Also, some some parrotfish are feeding on sponges, but. I guess most famously, it's also uh, hawksbill turtles. So turtles also are feeding on, on, on sponges. And that might be now that there are less and less turtles because they are uh, unfortunately or were hunted and have less and less of these beaches where they can lay eggs. It might be that in the past, there were less sponges because there were more turtles uh, grazing on them. Thank you, Ben. Um, and just we've seen pictures of, of lots of different types of sponges. How many species of sponge do we know? And that question is from uh, Trey Robert Primary and Wobbledon High. 
A lot, a lot, because sponges, they, they are aquatic. They are not just here on coral reefs. You can find them also in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Baltic Sea or, or, or in the North Sea, or basically in, in all seas, you can find them. You can even find them in, in fresh water. So you can find them shallow. You can find them in the deep sea. We were also doing some work in the deep sea of Norway. Uh, it's very, very difficult to say how many sponges there actually will be but there are uh, thousands of species that, exactly. that are there. And there will be many, many more if we start to look more into them. There we go for students watching. Uh, opportunity to get out there and find new sponge species uh, around the planet from the shallows to the deep ocean. Um, from Wimbledon High again, um, how long do sponges live for? That is a very good question. And um, so exactly, we do not really know that actually, because um, it's different as with a tree, for example, where you can cut the tree afterwards and you can kind of count the, the, the growth bands, what you have. We do not have something similar with sponges. We expect that these giant barrel sponges that uh, grow that big, they can easily get hundreds of years old. And, uh, and what sponges can also do is sometimes almost the whole sponge dies and it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And then when you come the next time, it's fairly big again. So, so they also can rejuvenate. They can, they can partly die or regress, get smaller, but then they grow back. So to really see how old that animal is, it's still a big challenge to actually find out. Ben, best guest, oldest, uh, oldest sponge ever. Oldest sponge ever. Uh, I would say maybe uh, on the tropical coral reefs, maybe 500 years old. However, in the deep sea, everything goes much slower. And there you also have some sponges that are this big. So they maybe are even a thousand years old. Thousand years old. Wow, wow, wow. Um, uh, so question here on, on sponge reproduction and using this term budding, do all sponges reproduce by budding? How, how do you get another sponge? Or how do they grow? So there are some sponges that actually do the budding. So basically just make a, make a, small, a, a, a small copy of, them, of themselves. And it's, it's an identical, identical sponge. Basically, you have two individuals that are exactly the same, but which is good and, and which, which allows you to, to also um, grow faster and to, and to populate um, an, an area very fast. The only problem is that you don't have then sexual reproduction uh, with it. So basically, it's, it's exactly the same copy. And maybe you are very good with dealing with heat, but then you are very bad with dealing with certain pathogens. And if everyone uh, cannot good deal with heat, then, and then you get a heat wave, then all of them would die. So the, the nice thing is they also do sexual reproduction. So there's spawning, also sponge spawning. We know much, much less about it than about coral spawning, but also their sponges release eggs and, and sperm and get the new combinations. And then it can be that one individual um, is good uh, to withstand uh, uh, diseases and other ones are good with high temperatures. And again, other ones can grow very fast. And then basically, no matter what, what nature is basically throwing at you, some, of, some individuals will always survive and mix their, their, um, their traits that they have. So, so very, very interesting and important point there, uh, which is that with cloning, then you have the same animal which uh, has the same traits or characteristics, whereas if there's uh, uh, sex reproduction, which means um, sort of two parents, as it were, then you get more variation, which means that it's more likely to be able to, or one of those, you know, offspring is more able to deal with uh, different threats in the environment. Yeah, or just can do things better. Can do things better. Brilliant. Um, question here. Should we stop buying natural sponges? And, and it, would that be considered animal cruelty if, I, if I'm using a sponge um, at bath time? Okay, should we stop uh, buying sponges? So in the, in the past, when you only had the natural sponges, they were over harvested at many, many places. And now, uh, for example, uh, off the Florida Keys or also in the Mediterranean, there are many areas where you can hardly find them anymore. So it's not feasible 
uh, to to uh, collect them. There are still some areas people are also looking into aquaculture to to basically grow them there. That's easier to harvest. I think um, it can be done in a sustainable way, but it has to be controlled. And as far as I know, largely that is also happening uh, now more and more. Uh, animal cruelty. It's difficult to say because um, on the one hand, sponge, sponges are regarded to be very simple animals. So, for example, they don't have nerves. Nevertheless, they can still do so many things. They can uh, sponge cells can communicate with each other. They can do the pumping. They can do many different things. Um, yeah. Um, I never thought about it from an ethical uh, point of view, but Let's put it like this. When you are a, a vegetarian or vegan and you don't want to eat animals, then maybe it's also better to buy a synthetic sponge and not the animal sponge uh, with you. And now the other, I mean, you talk about synthetic sponges there, which is a, which, which is a great sort of animal sort of, you know, sort of saving way. Uh, I mean, perhaps that, I mean, even sort of stopping our use of, of plastics and synthetics maybe there's also sort of loofers and another sort of plant-based uh, alternatives as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, Ben, um, next up, Sydenham High would like to know how do sponges make all those bonkers colours that you see on the reef? They can, so sponges they can live together, similar to, to corals, with many different small animals. So, or, or plants. So some of them also have algae that can also give some of the colors, but they also have a lot of microbes that are growing in them and they also just uh, produce them. I mean, uh, so it's, it's a combination of, of, all these, of all these things. And, and uh, exactly these, these sponges, they are often much more colorful than many other things that are growing on the coral reef. And, and um, I think we, we've covered these, some of these questions of, of the sort of water sponges need to live in or the sponges only live on coral reefs. You mentioned there that um, they're all over the world and indeed in, in fresh water as well as yes. um, seawater. Interesting question we're, we're getting into here is, is, is your job. Is, is This is from the, the students at Sydney High Prep. What first interested you in corals and sponges? So I think the, the, the first uh, step towards it, the, the first fascination basically was just their beauty. So if you see a coral reef and then you're just overwhelmed by, by the different colors, by the different organisms, everything uh, just together. So I think that is, that is the first part. And then you can say, well, um, yeah, but why then sponges? And then I must say with the sponges, even though they can be very pretty, but then the most interesting thing for me is what sponges do. So this is what we talked before about how important they are on the reef by taking out bacteria, but also making uh, food available, converting this sugary water into, into yummy food that others can, can grow and how important they are. I think it's then more about what they do. That is what still intrigues me the most and why I'm still continuing to do research on them. Fan and fantastic and super interesting. There's some more questions coming in, but I'm just going to break here to just to look at, you know, how do you go about studying? I mean, certainly I remember when I was um, at uh, primary school, elementary school, science was all about, you know, questions and observing and doing tests. It is that what you still do as a professional scientist? It's basically exactly what you do. It's exactly what you do. You you are first you first observe and then you try to explain it. You 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 think about a question. That's the number first thing. You need a question. Then you start formulating a hypothesis, and then you try. Okay, how can I test this hypothesis? Is it true? And then you do your experiment, and you have to make sure that okay, how can I test it the best way? that I'm not just doing it once, because if something happens, then you can see that it, it, it works. That can be just by chance. So you have to do it multiple times, multiple times, and you want to be sure that each time when you do it, the conditions are exactly the same. You, you, you want to use the same animals. You want to use the same, let's say, water temperature. You want to give them the same um, 
we have these incubation chambers, for example, we want to have them that they have the same flow inside, that they have the same amount of water, that you do the experiment for the same amount of time. So all these things, what you also do in your in your science classes, it's basically exactly the same thing. The only thing that is different that uh, we sometimes use them more fancy techniques or, or methodologies uh, to answer our questions. But in principle, it's the same. It's exactly the same. Well, that, that's fantastic to hear that uh, you share uh, those basics of observing, testing, making sure your tests are fair, and, and curiosity with all the budding young scientists who are watching. Absolutely fab. Um, ben, we've got some more, more uh, sponge questions very, very quickly. Um, which animal group um, is a coral in? Sorry, sponge, but just coming on to the general reef. Coral, what type of animal is it? It's uh, uh, coral belong to cnidarians, so it's it's the, it's the coral. So you have hard corals, then you have also soft corals that don't form these calcium carbonate uh, skeletons. But you also have jellyfish, for example. They also are parts of of um, of the cnidarians. And basically, if you look at a jellyfish, a jellyfish is basically a a upside down um, um, coral polyp, so a small coral animal and much bigger and is uh, swimming around. Brilliant. So there we go. Coral, corals related to uh, jellyfish and sea anemones. Um, coming on to a, a couple of questions on um, whether sponges and, and the reef is, are, are endangered. And this is sort of mix up from Sydenham High, St Anne's Primary and Wimbledon High. Are sponges endangered? And then what can we do to protect sponges? So sponges were endangered and are still in the places where they were over harvested. So that is basically when it just got uh, too much of, of taking out similar what you also can see with overfishing if you catch too many fish. So that is one part. Uh, the other part is, of course, that um, now it's everywhere over the news that uh, coral reefs are endangered. They are endangered by by um, pollution, for example, that is happening there, but also um, ocean warming, so that you get then the coral bleaching. And wild sponges are not are usually not as much affected by the bleaching, so they can handle better with the higher temperatures. Sponges, at least on coral reefs, need the coral. If the coral is not there anymore and build these structures and maintains these structures, then there won't be coral reefs anymore. And then the sponges has no place where they can grow. So. So they are living together. Also, the, the corals are actually the ones that also make these this sugary water. So if you don't have the corals anymore that make the sugary water, then also sponges have less to eat. So um, I think they are also um, threatened in, in a way, but maybe a little bit further down, down the road. And the best thing to protect sponges is basically to protect their ecosystem, so to protect coral reefs in general. And by doing that, or the environment also, if sponges grow in, in, in other places, you want to protect the whole ecosystem, the whole environment. And by doing that, you will also protect them. Ben, one or maximum two things that a student sitting in a classroom or at home in England could do, or, or indeed in any other country, um, could do to protect the reef? To protect the reef, uh, I think one thing is what I said just before, one issue is uh, global warming. So everything what you can do to also reduce CO2 emissions is of course one step that you can do. And another thing is I think what is important to also just find out more about coral reefs and then tell other people about it. Because uh, you, you, you might think, yeah, coral reefs, why should we care about them? They are not that important. So just to make it aware, that make people aware of it, you only protect something or you make decisions when you know about it. But so by just finding out yourself about it and then telling it to others, that will be, I think, a big thing what everyone, also every student at home uh, can do. Ben, thank you. We've got some questions now on, on being being a scientist, uh, working on the reef. Uh, this is from the Willows Primary and asking 
what made you initially want to become a scientist? What made me become a scientist? I must say, um, I got fascinated uh, with nature in general, but specifically with the seas by documentaries that I was watching when I was uh, a child. And that was uh, most famously Jacques Cousteau, the, the old documentaries from there. And it's just brilliant to to, uh, to to see it. And there was the first love. And then it's you're fascinated by it in combination with curiosity. Then you see something, you think, wow, that's amazing. But then the next step is like, hey, how does it work? And how exactly is it? And, and I think that is the main thing. Um, to do research, you have to have this curiosity. You have to wonder about things, and then you have to ask questions, and then you have to become a detective and start trying to figure out and answer these questions. Amazing. And um, Ben, just, just looking for uh, what skills um, do you think are required to be a coral scientist? And that's from Emilio uh, Espinosa at the Gutenberg Schüler in Ecuador. So one of the most important things is observations. You want to observe, first you have to be really critical and you have to be able to observe something. What is, how does it work? What is different if you see two things are the same or do you notice, hey, there, there is something different. So that's the first thing, observing very, very uh, closely. The, the second part then is, you have to have this intrinsic motivation and curiosity to say like, okay, I want to figure it out. I want to find out about it. And then uh, it is of course uh, thinking and you, you can train it also analytical thinking. So to put all these puzzle pieces uh, basically together. But of course, if you want to then go really hardcore into science, you also have to learn skills. Uh, math is very important because you have to, you, you do experiments and you do them so and so many times, then you have to see, do they happen by chance or is it something because um, uh, you, you, you want to validate it? So you have to be able to do statistics. You need some math. You need to understand how physics work because we're in a physical work world. You want to understand about chemistry as well because there are also like these these sugars, you you know, okay, there are, there are some substances that I'm taking about what are they actually? what can be done with it. And so there are many aspects, but the most important thing is observations, is curiosity, and then trying to play detective and finding out how it works. Amazing. Uh, ben, we've got next one is, is, is from St. Anne's Primary. And I know you've, you came out to Curacao uh, a few weeks ago and you'll stay until March um, next year. Uh, what's it like to be surrounded by marine life every day? For me, I must say that it's amazing. And that is really what makes, one of the things that makes that uh, job that I'm doing so special. I'm now very fortunate that I can do it, but there were other times where sometimes for nine months uh, or even 10 months, I was only in the lab or was uh, in the office, didn't have access to actually go in the field. So the highlights are always, if you can go in the field, if you can be there, if you can see these animals, if you can, if you can just observe and enjoy also the beauty of it. Fantastic. And, and thinking about all the places you've been, uh, the Willows Primary and Taverner family would like to know what's the best place that you've been, your, your favorite uh, underwater mission? The favorite underwater mission? Um, it's very difficult to say because everything is a coral reef here looks very different, let's say, from a coral reef in the Philippines, and I really enjoyed it. And then um, I was uh, lucky enough three years ago that we also started to go in the deep sea and then go to cold water coral reefs and to cold water sponge grounds. And then to see that also is, is just amazing because you don't expect it to be there. And just each time when you're surprised by it. So I think there is beauty everywhere. You just have to be able also also to see it. And I don't want to say the best reefs are here or are there. They're just very different and they're all beautiful. Thank you, Ben. Very, very sort of even-handed uh, approach there to, to all our wonderful um, underwater environments and habitats. Um, very interesting question that's come through from Wimbledon High, um, just in terms of your science work. How do you make sure that you don't cause any harm um when when you're when you're doing your research i mean i think i've seen photographs of bits of you know you've got bits of sponge in the lab 
is that you know too much or the you know how how do you reduce harm when you're doing your work? I mean, to be honest, if you do something, if you manipulate something, you will always have an effect. It will always have an effect, but you try to keep the effect as small as possible. So we are very careful when we actually, for example, collect sponges. The thing is also with depends on the sponge. Uh, when you have a big barrel sponge, you don't want to cut a piece out of it and it most likely wouldn't uh, lift just by itself anymore. However, if you have these uh, encrusting uh, sponges that are really thin and sometimes they can be like a square meter or even bigger, if you cut out a piece of there and you give it some time to heal, then actually um, that sponge, it will form a completely new individual and that will be uh, a clone, of course, of the, of the original one. But um, both sponges, the part that, that you cut out, plus also the sponge where it was cut out, they will be just uh, living all fine. And we use them for experiments. And sometimes we have to analyze them and unfortunately also have to kill them for doing the analyses. But if we don't have to do that, then we just return them afterwards also back on the reef. So try to really think how many sponges do, or how many animals, whatever it is, do you need be very careful with taking them. Take good care that you can uh, just with a small amount of, of them do your experiments and if possible, return them back and uh, make sure that they're doing good afterwards. Ben, thank you so much. Um, great question here through from Sydney and Prep and very, very interesting. I saw you canoeing out with your, your, with your aqualong and, and diving equipment there. But if you didn't have um, that, how long can you swim um, and how deep can you swim underwater for? Okay, uh, that is a good question. I must say I didn't, I didn't uh, practice it that much anymore, but I would say uh, free diving. I was just here in August where we did then free diving. We collected water samples at 10 meters. So 10 meters I can do for sure and still do something underwater, but you're down maybe for one and a half minutes or so, maybe two, but half of the time you need to go uh, up and down and then your, your time down there is very limited. So if it's really shallow, you can also do a lot of things snorkeling, but um, to really do more elaborate experiments, you just need to use either uh, a scuba tank or if more fancy now with these dive robots that you use one of these remotely operated vehicles, which also have cameras and these arms that you can also manipulate can pick up things. They have a kind of a vacuum cleaner where you can also suck up things. So um, just free diving will be in most cases uh, difficult to do. And, and Ben, um, you were away for a number of months. Is it, is it sad to be away from your family? Uh, yes, of course. I mean, the best thing is, of course, if the family can come uh, with you, that is not always possible. And while it is amazing that that I could, I was so far able to travel to many different places and I'm really enjoying to go there, uh, see uh, reefs or ecosystems at other places, meet other people, see new cultures. It's It's amazing. But yes, indeed, it is also something, especially after some time that you feel like, hey, um, I'm also missing my family, I'm missing my home. Uh, so that is also something, if you want to become a researcher and you want to travel the world, being aware of that you may not be able to be with the loved ones all the time, uh, missing birthdays, missing, missing other things. So that is also part of the job that uh, you have to keep in mind. Um, ben, very sadly, we're running out of time. Um, some quick fire questions from the Tavener family, Emma Posey and Micah. Scariest uh, thing you've seen in the ocean? The scariest thing I see in the ocean was actually when I was diving and next to me, a big anchor went down and almost hit me. I would say that was uh, the most scariest thing because that could have gone really wrong. Uh, uh, from James, your favorite sea animal? My favorite sea animal, and I suppose it's that's a, it cannot be a sponge because I was talking so much about sponges, then I would say a manta ray. Manta ray, amazing. Uh, project you're working on at the moment, all about, it's still about sponges, still about sugar in the water and turning it into munchy stuff? Exactly, oh. exactly about that and really digging into it, into, that is the more chemistry, what these sugars actually are, which bits are taken up and what is happening with them, exactly. And just a tiny little question at the end. Um, 
plastics. We hear a lot about plastics in the news and especially with um, the sort of face mask and everything with the pandemic. Uh, waste plastics, do they endanger coral? And that's from Sydenham, Sydenham High Prep. Uh, yes, certainly. I mean, uh, you, you can see that a lot that you have plastic garbage that can damage coral, that can also cover it. So, so you have that issue. And now what is becoming more and more aware is these microplastics, so these tiny, tiny little bits and pieces. And we don't know much about it yet. Uh, we don't know um, how bad the, the, the effect on corals or spiders or other animals might be that they accumulated. Uh, we do know, but there's still a lot of research to be done what the actual effects are. Ben, thank you so, so much. Uh, and I know there's some questions that we didn't get to. We have a session after this uh, in about 45 minutes time, and we don't have a session after that. So that any questions uh, that we haven't come to, we'll make sure that we get to in the next session. As with all our live lessons, they are available to watch on catch up, either on the Encounter EDU website, encounteredu.com, or on our YouTube channel, the Search Encounter EDU. Um, so if there are things that have, you know, questions that have come up uh, during this talk that you want answered, do get them in the live chat. We'll leave the live chat running uh, for a few moments more. Um, all ones that we haven't come to, we'll, we'll make sure all those get answered. But Ben, thank you so, so much uh, for sparing your time away from your important research on sponges. Uh, and the wonders of the underwater world uh, around Curaçao. Thank you to all the students who've been watching. And until the next time, it's goodbye from Axa Coral Live. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.